dangerous jobs in history. Hat maker. When you think of a dangerous job in history, you might think of the occupation of a soldier or someone who dealt with disease like a plague doctor. But you would not think that hat making would be so dangerous. In the 1500s, the milliner became a term to describe a trader that specialized in importing women's accessories from Milan. As hats began to become a popular status symbol for men around the 14th century, by the 17th century, mass production of these fashion items became necessary to meet the growing demands of Western society. Being a milliner became a lucrative business to be a part of, and the variety of materials used by hat makers bred experimentation in style and production. It was soon discovered that moistening the fibers of felt and fur with mercuric nitrate created a superior material that could also be made quickly. This development in hat making was supposedly discovered by a French milliner being treated for syphilis with mercury, who used his own urine to separate the animal's fur from its skin. By the 19th century, it was already common practice to use the mercury compound in manufacturing, called carroting. The process involved washing fur in an orange-colored solution containing mercurial nitrate. While the use of the substance made matting and removing the fur from the pelt much easier, long-term exposure to the vapors released from the liquid could develop into a serious health condition called erethism. Because mercury attacks the nervous system, symptoms of erethism are both psychological and physical in nature. Mentally, it initially manifests as a struggle to control one's emotions, high levels of social anxiety, and an inability to think or speak clearly. As the body's motor functions begin to break down, severe tremors, a stumbling gait, and drooling would make many people mistake the sickness for drunkenness. In extreme cases, the inflicted will be beset by hallucinations, delirium, and extreme paranoia. As the associations between milliners and the symptoms of erethism became evident, it is believed that the term mad hatter and mad as a hatter came to be used to describe this particular type of psychosis. Hatter's shakes became a term to describe the intense muscle spasms and tremors seen in workers of the trade. Near the end of the 19th century, the dangers of mercury poisoning in the profession of millinery began to be studied by the French Academy of Medicine. By 1874, alternatives had been developed to replace mercurial nitrate, and by the turn of the century, laws in England and France were enacted to protect the workers in hat manufacturing. Unfortunately, mercury poisoning would nonetheless continue to plague milliners in the first half of the 20th century. The United States had developed an alternative method by using hydrochloride, but the poisonous mercury compound would be used up until the early part of the Second World War. Mercury was a key material in detonators for explosives, and the needs of the war forced American millinery manufacturers to finally adopt the new processes already developed. In 1941, millineries in the United States finally agreed to use hydrogen peroxide instead of mercurial nitrate. Millinery as a craft began to be slowly phased out through the development of new technologies and methods in industry. And with the cultural attitudes that emerged from the wars in the 50s and 60s, hats no longer were the symbols of status they once were. The making of everyday products was a laborious and often dangerous affair before modern industry, and hats were no different. Lewis Carroll's character in Alice in Wonderland, the Hatter, exhibits many of the traits of erethism, but he may have been inspired by a furniture dealer that was colloquially called the Mad Hatter because of his eccentric personality. Nonetheless, this expression was commonly used by Carol's time, and the implications between hat-making and psychosis had already made its way into everyday vocabulary. Whether intentional or not, the title preserves the memory of what was once a grim and dangerous job, the job of the hat-maker. Gong Farmer Disgusting Jobs in History A job as disgusting as it was dangerous, until the development of modern plumbing, the gong farmer filled an important role within communities. Like most professions centered on the upkeep of everyday human life, these workers toiled tirelessly to maintain the status quo expected of a civilized society. The gong farmer was also called by another name, nightmen, reflecting the dark hours they were allowed to do their work. Collecting and disposing of human waste, after all, was best kept out of daylight and out of the sight of others. The term gong comes from the Old English word gang, meaning to go, 
and its use to describe this particular task began during the Tudor period of the 15th and 16th centuries in England. Before modern times, public latrines were commonly used in urban areas to collect refuse in large cesspits dug far down beneath them. To keep satisfactory levels of sanitation, the maintenance and construction of cesspits and cesspools was important in preventing the spread of disease within a city or town. Properly built, it might take a year or more before needing to be excavated, though many still needed to be cleaned out several times annually. Built less than watertight to allow liquids to drain out of the waste, what was left within the cesspit needed to be collected and disposed of in a more permanent manner before it began to overflow. This night soil could be taken to a larger cesspit outside of town called a lay stall, or in many cases could be sold as fertilizer to local farmers. It was the task of the gong farmer to see these things done, and though it was a job better left unspoken of by the local populace, many of them maintained a professional attitude about their work. Often the job would be done by three or four men at a time. After traversing down into the cesspit, the designated hole man would begin by filling a bucket or tub with waste. The rope man would then pull the bucket out and hand it to the tub man, who would then proceed to carry it to a cart for transportation. In larger operations, chutes and pipes would be employed to expedite the removal of material. But whether it was public or private, large or small, the nightmen would diligently remove the excrement from the pits until they were safe for use again. In many cases, when improperly maintained, cesspits and cesspools could break and spill out into streets, yards, and houses. If left unchecked, waste could make its way into wells and contaminate entire water supplies. Thus, the gong farmer was ever important to ensure the welfare and safety of the community. But besides being a nauseating job, the nightman's working conditions presented serious hazards to his health. They faced increased risks of infection, sickness, and disease from exposure to their harvest, while poor ventilation could mean death from asphyxiation. Though it often paid well, gong farming was always considered a miserable trade to be in. When seen, a nightman was essentially wallowing in human refuse, becoming covered in the muck as he worked away. Drowning and suffocation was a danger for nightmen and citizens alike. The maintenance and construction of cesspits and latrines presented hazards of their own. When full, the woodwork could begin to fall apart and give way, making traps out of the installations. In one of the earliest accounts of waste disposal, the 14th century sanitation worker Richard the Raker fell through the boards of a poorly kept privy and drowned in the excrements below. Gong farming as a profession slowly began to disappear throughout the 19th century, as better sanitation practices and infrastructure were developed to deal with the never-ending problem of waste removal. Though difficult to construct, underground sewer systems became a priority in overcrowded cities, and the invention of the water closet, or flush toilet, revolutionized the methods of refuse disposal. It was the end of a difficult and dangerous job, but it was a job most, if not all, were happy to see disappear. Disgusting Jobs in History Tosha Toshas, or sewer hunters, were people who ventured into the filthy sewers looking for valuable items, such as copper coins or gold to sell on. Victorian London was becoming a crowded, urbanized metropolis, and the sewer network was under great pressure to wash away the growing population's waste. This disgusting job offered many dangers. The dark tunnels often crumbled under deterioration which could bury you alive. You could get lost in the complex maze-like network of the London sewers. There was risk of suffocation from breathing in pockets of noxious fumes or foul air. Sometimes when the sluices were lifted, a rush of water entered the sewers, posing a risk of drowning in excrement. and the most feared threat, rats. Swarms of rats hid in the dark shadows waiting to attack. The rodents were rampant in Victorian cities and caused disease. One tosher said when a rat bite is bad, it festers and forms a hard core in the ulcer, which throbs very much indeed. This core is as big as a boiled fish's eye. There are accounts of swarms of rats overpowering sewer hunters tearing them to pieces and to be discovered by their fellow Toshers washed up on the Thames the next day. This is why Toshers preferred to move into the sewers in gangs of three or four, led by an experienced veteran. 
Tosh has used a variety of tools for the job, as well as carrying lanterns for the dark tunnels and a pan for sieving raw sewage from valuable items, Tosh has carried a pole around, which was seven or eight feet long, with a large iron hoe on the end. This vital tool was used in case the Tosher sank into a quagmire, enabling him to attach onto something solid to pull himself out. It could also be used to dig through rubbish and uncover the treasure they were looking for. Toshers wore long coats with large pockets for holding the items they collected, canvas trousers and old slops for shoes. They also wore a canvas apron and carried a bag on their side. After 1840, it was made illegal to enter the London sewers without permission because of the dangers they poised. Large fines or even prison time were enforced if detected, and informers were rewarded handsomely. So Toshers switched to working at night by lantern light. Even though the job was highly undesirable, Toshers thought of themselves as above mudlarks, people who searched the Thames for coal, wood, or rope. As they were searching for more valuable items, such as gold or silver, they were thought of as the elite of the scavengers. They also made a good living at around six shillings a day, putting them in the top earners of the Victorian London working class. Chimney Sweep – Dangerous Jobs in History Chimney sweepers, as the name implies, had the job of climbing up into narrow chimneys to clean the ash and soot away. Without this maintenance, chimneys could catch fire. The job had been around for some time, but it wasn't until the 18th century that the demand really increased with the rise of urbanization and the Industrial Revolution. And as fireplaces were the source of heat for most homes, the job was in high demand. Master sweeps took on apprentices known as climbing boys. Children became the preferred person for the job of chimney sweep due to their small size, which made it possible for them to climb into the stone chimneys. These climbing boys were poor and recruited from workhouses and orphanages. Sometimes they were kidnapped by the chimney sweepers or sold to them by their parents. The climbing boy had to climb up chimneys with a large flat brush over his head, using his elbows and knees to move up like a caterpillar. He also had a metal scraper to take away tougher bits. The nastiest of masters would prod the climber or start the fireplace to terrify the climbing boy into working faster. Once they reached the top of the chimney, they would slide down and bag up all the soot at the bottom to take away. When they climbed up, the climbing boy's elbows and knees were often scraped raw and they would be covered in calluses. The job was also claustrophobic because of the narrow chimneys sometimes so narrow that the climbing boy could become stuck with their knees close to their chin. If a layer of soot fell while they were trapped like this, they could die from suffocation or burned alive if the chimney caught a light. There were also long-term effects of repeated exposure to the inside of chimneys. Inhaling the poisonous soot, dust and smoke caused irreversible lung damage and disease which would eventually cause death. Their joints could also become deformed from staying in cramped positions for so long. There was no pay for climbing boys, which was taken by the master sweep. Instead, they were given food and a place to sleep. Because of the narrow construction of chimneys, younger children were used, sometimes as young as four. By the time they were 10, they were usually too tall. The climbing boys were purposely kept malnourished, so their stunted growth would enable them to keep doing the job. In 1803, a new mechanical brush was invented as an alternative, but chimney sweeps and their clients still preferred to use climbing boys to do the job. In Britain in 1840, a law was passed which made it illegal for any person under 21 to climb a chimney and raised the minimum age of apprenticeship to 16, although it was mostly ignored. A Chimney Sweepers Act passed in 1875, which required sweeps to be licensed and made it the duty of the police to enforce it, finally putting an end to child chimney sweeps. Leech Collector – Disgusting Jobs in History Leeches were used throughout history in medicine to relieve all kinds of ailments, from headaches to hysteria. Hieroglyphics painted on walls show ancient Egyptians using leeches to treat patients. During the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, barber surgeons and plague doctors applied leeches to suck out the bad blood during plagues. 
But in the early 1800s, there was a leech craze, which spread throughout Europe and America like no other, which became an important part of the bloodletting process used by many medical practitioners. Medical practitioners applied leeches to the patient's mouth and inside of the throat using a leech glass, and sometimes patients even swallowed them. The peak of the leech mania was in the 1830s, when tens of millions of leeches were used every year in France, England, Germany, and the United States to the extent that demand was outstripping supply. The leech collector became a familiar sight. Although old horses were used if available, the leech collector would commonly wade into the bogs and marshes themselves bare-legged. They did this so the leeches would latch onto their legs, thinking they were cattle, and start drawing the blood with their front teeth. The leech collector was traditionally a female occupation, done by poor women in the countryside in areas such as the Lake District in England. While the job wasn't physically demanding, there were obvious dangers. The leech collectors could suffer from a severe loss of blood or infection. Leeches would suck onto the collector's legs for up to 20 minutes, and the wounds could continue to bleed for 10 hours. When the leech collector had had enough, they placed the leeches in a bucket and sold them to a medical practitioner. Leech collecting was not a well-paid job and could only be done during the hotter months, as leeches are less active during the colder seasons. The occupation went on the decline, as the human blood-sucking species of leech was becoming extinct in Europe due to over-collecting and the medical value of bloodletting declined in the late 19th century, as new discoveries were made. Groom of the Stool – Disgusting Jobs in History What was a job in Tudor times that required absolute trust, paid well, but was very smelly? This was the Groom of the King's Close Stool, or Groom of the Stool. In this job, the Groom of the Stool would undress the King and waited for the King to finish going to the toilet. Then he would wipe the king's backside using cotton and a bowl of water, drying it with a towel. Sometimes the excrement was taken away to be inspected by doctors to make sure the king was healthy. The groom would monitor the king's diet and mealtimes, scheduling his day around when he needed to go to the toilet. The job title emerged during the 15th century with the invention of the clothes stool. This was a portable toilet that resembled a chair with a chamber pot underneath. The groom of the stool first appeared in records in 1495 during Henry VII's reign alongside the founding of the privy chamber. The groom would be the head of this chamber alongside other servants who attended to the monarch in his private rooms. While originally a role for people of low status, when Henry VIII became King of England, it became a privileged position. The title was only given to those close to the king, so naturally it would go to a court companion such as a son of a nobleman or a member of the gentry. This was because the privy chamber became a part of Henry's government, so the job required someone who could be trusted and who could keep secrets. While the job was disgusting, the groom of the stool was of very high status, was well paid, and had direct access to the king, making him very powerful. The groom also administered some of the royal finances, having power over the privy purse. One of the king's grooms, however, did not have such a successful career. Henry Norris, who was Henry VIII's groom of the stool, was executed after being accused of treason and adultery with Queen Anne Boleyn. The job of groom of the stool, which was male only, came to an end under Queen Elizabeth I, who had a first lady of the bedchamber then revived on the accession of James I, with the groom of the stool now head of the bedchamber.